So what can Formula One teach business about data? So I'm going to change a little bit the tone of the, of the afternoon, I suspect, because I'm going to go into a little bit of the sport. I don't know whether we've got fans in the audience, but I'll explain a little bit where I'm going. One of the things I wanted to say is business. What I mean about business, I mean business with complex operations. Now, we often think that is business with com complex operation. Of course it is. We've been drill drilling in the North Sea for the last 40 years. We don't drill vertically, we drill vertically and then horizontally. It's difficult. There's a lot of planning. There's a lot of data analysis done in order to prepare the next well. How do we do that? Well, well, we prepare, we do models, we have a plan. Another industry where they do that a lot is in air traffic control. Of course, they have to coordinate thousands of flights coming in, landing, leaving. They have operation, they have different KPIs. They have KPIs for on-time departure, leaving, misconnections. That's a lot to do in your head. So of course, you plan, you do models. And there's a massive link with F1. F1 is not just about a car going around the track. Well, it is, <laughs> to some extent. There's a big team behind, though, that makes that happen. A lot of people forget that. Uh, being an engineer that have worked 11 years on the F1 side, there's a lot of engineers doing this. Okay? There's one driver, but a massive team of engineers doing this. And one of the things that invariably happen, we, we plan our races very, very well, but things go wrong. And when things go wrong in Formula One, it's not going wrong like here. It may not have the economic or safety consequences that it has in an oil rig, but it's very public. Millions of people watch a Formula One race. So, you know, it's quite uncomfortable when things go wrong. So I'm going to give you an example of a few years ago at a Monaco Grand Prix. Now, Monaco has been on the Formula One calendar for years. And for those of you who don't follow Formula One, it's also one of the races where it's perspective particularly difficult to drive because there's no runoff areas. It's a street, it's the streets of Monaco, co cornered off for, for um, a, well, I guess three days of the year. And the, the story I'm going to tell you is, it was compounded by the fact that it was pouring with rain. So a few years ago, when Lewis Hamilton was driving for, for McLaren at that stage, he started third on the, on the, on the grid on a pouring Monaco. And he had an amazing start, got into second place. Fantastic. Everyone was going, great, you know, we're, we might just do it. We'd done loads of planning beforehand, all our race strategy done, and then this happened. On turn 12, over there, it, it, didn't just, it wasn't just a puncture, he actually hit the wall, tire exploded. Right, no more right hand rear tire. In some way, it's great, the pit lane is only 15 seconds away. So he managed to drive his car back in without damaging the suspension. But on the flip side, it also means that you've only got 15 seconds to get your crew out and then decide what you're going to do. Because you need tires and at that time you needed refueling as well. 15 seconds to do that, to plan, and then you get your car out again. Now, of course, I chose this example because we won the race. But actually, when you listen to the commentators on the, on the television, they really thought this was the end of Lewis's race. Why is that? Because there was a lot of very difficult decision to be made in the 15 seconds. Because, as I said, it was pouring with rain at the start of the race. But by lap six out of 78, by the way, at lap six, the Rain as he had he eased off. So a lot less rain, track still wet. So hmm, what do you do? Do you stay on wet tires? Do you go on intermediate? Also, do you refuel to the end of the race? Whew. If you're heavy, you go slowly. But how many, therefore, how many other pit stops do you need to do? Because every pit stop slows you down. And Monaco, as I said, is very difficult to drive. And therefore, it's very difficult to overtake because not much space. So if there's a race where race strategy is important, it's Monaco. So if I take a step back and saying, well, there was a lot of chances that we got the decision wrong. Let's ask ourselves the question, why do we make bad decisions generally? Well, super scientifically, obviously. This, we say, generally speaking, actually, people who care, people who make the decisions, you know, people with authority and people with knowledge and information, 
very few people that actually are in that sweet spot, at least in, our, in, in, in the industries that we've dealt with. We may not be able to do much about the people who care, but we certainly can give more insights to people who will make the decision, people with authority. And in a data-rich environment, like this, like Formula One, we can do this. So, of course, we didn't put our engineers in front with 15 seconds to make all these decisions. Quickly, let's run our simulation. No, of course not. What we did is we knew that there's only so many things that will go wrong. We keep running our simulations all the time with the new data that is coming in. If you've got new data, use it. Use it to prepare what your next best step will be if something happens. And of course, you know, things like if a safety car comes out, what do I do? We knew that the, 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 the weather forecast had said it would stop raining. So you make all those different calculations in the background. We run thousands of simulation. And then we have a dashboard that helps the user who is on the pit wall make the next best decision. Now, you might say, well, that works in Formula One because in Formula One, it's simple. Can it work anywhere else? Of course it can. That first slide that I showed you about a, the drilling in the North Sea, we've actually implemented a system <laughs> like that there. And the reason is that we have, as I said before, been drilling in the North Sea for 40 years. There's a lot of data that exists about that. There's a lot of models that are there. And these days, with AI as well, which we do, machine learning and so on, what we can do is analyze that data that is also coming in live as you're drilling and be able to tell more, give more information to the driller. Now, before we, we started working with them, the minute something went wrong, the driller said, the model's wrong. Because the model didn't expect to have, let's say, a pack off or a myosin gas event. That doesn't mean that the model is wrong. It might mean that you're not actually where you think you are, for example. They weren't re-computing their models as the new data was coming in. Now, it's not easy to collect data in the North Sea when you're drilling, so there's not a huge amount of data coming back. But use it, and they weren't. They weren't using the data live. That data, in fact, as, as um, was mentioned quite a bit today, that data was saved as a PDF and kept. Now, how can you do anything with that? So the first thing that we did is make sure that we could have access to that data live. Once you have that, you can then start looking at all those different conflicting KPIs that, that a driller has. They have to go fast because drilling in the North Sea is about a million pounds a day. They also, the, the well integrity is super important because if you build it too tight, too tightly, and it breaks down, you have to close the well, you've lost even more money. And of course, what they want to do is, is drill where the density of the rock is, is appropriate. So they, and this is where the modeling comes in as well. But actually, there's only so many things that can go wrong, and you can use that data that is coming to give alternatives to the driller. And the point is not to say, we'll do automatic drilling here. We're giving opportunities for the driller to make the best decision that there is. So if I wind back to the, to the initial question, you know, can Formula One help businesses? I think that in circumstances, and the lesson learned that we've done 20 years in Formula One, is that you can arm the people making decisions by keeping your data up, by keeping your models and the decision support tool dynamic. You keep computing that, you arm your decision makers with the best information, the best insight, and the companies that don't make use of that, they, they put themselves in a really bad position because we think that if you can actually react to disruption, you're, that's one of the main key to success for business. Thank you. <laughs>